Thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. I am Mustafa Sharif, an urban planner, and you're more than welcome to join my big journey of exploring the making of smarter and more livable cities. Please don't forget to follow Urbanistica on the different social media platforms and also let's connect on LinkedIn. Big thanks to Urbanistica podcast partner, Afri. Afri is an international engineering and design company providing sustainable solutions in the fields of energy, industry and infrastructure. Are you ready for a new episode? Let's go for it. Today we're going to talk about the urban, rural, sustainable links and relationships. I have the pleasure to welcome you, Clayman and Sofia, to Urbanistica podcast. Hey and welcome. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. My pleasure. How, how are you doing? Doing okay, I guess. <laughs> uh, since I come from Italy, uh, my family is struggling way more than me right now. I think in Bangkok we are kind of lucky compared to other places. Uh, we are in a lockdown at the moment, but uh, it's nothing like uh, uh, what you're experiencing in Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have uh, rising cases, but um, we're very hopeful that the government can uh, contain the uh, the outbreak right now. I understand. So I, w- I want to know more, like, what time is it now? Because it's, uh, I think, a uh, big time difference between, <laughs> between Stockholm and Bangkok. Yeah. 2 p.m., six hours difference. Yeah, it's almost like 8 a.m. Right. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I'm happy to see you actually, and I'm full of energy. So let's uh, start with you. You're our storyteller. So, uh, Sophia, I'm happy that you made this happen and you were coordinating this. I'm very thankful for that. So let's start with you. You're one of our storytellers for this episode. How would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us about your passion. Thank you so much. Uh, First of all, thank you so much, Mustafa, because uh, we met actually in person two years ago. Two years, right? Yeah, yeah. Already time flies. Um, In Stockholm. Yes, exactly. So he organized a hackathon about uh, urban planning. Mm. And I was there and then we reconnected. And then I followed your podcast like all the way, like since the very beginning. Yeah. And then you were like, hey, do you want to come like to be a speaker? And I was like, yeah, maybe maybe I want to, but I would like to be with my supervisor because we have a very good dynamic and we've been uh, discovering so many interesting topics together. Um, so at the moment, I'm doing a joint PhD actually in Bangkok and I'm doing it here at uh, SEI Asia, which is the Stockholm Environment Institute, which is an environmental think tank and also at Chulalongkorn University. Um, and uh, at Chulalongkorn University, I study at the Department of Environment, Development and Sustainability. And so my PhD is mostly related to food systems, uh, sustainable food systems, uh, and how um, community-based agritourism can link urban consumers uh, and rural food producers. So it's a lot about this uh, urban rural linkage linkages that we're gonna explore today yeah Yeah. i love it and tell me more sophia uh because we met two years ago so tell the listeners where you're from what did you study a little bit about your background the highlights sure sure um so yes my background um it's a bit uh, of a dynamic academic background i guess because i started studying international relations in my bachelor's And then I moved into uh, environmental policy because I was more interested in that uh, stream, let's say. And then for my PhD, I didn't want to do a normal, let's say, standard mainstream PhD. I wanted to do something a bit more challenging. And so when I came across this joint PhD idea, I was very fascinated by it because you get to um, yes, be in the academic field, but also do research with like practice oriented uh, people and uh, an institution like SCI, which is more hands on, I would say, in terms of the research that they conduct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy that you're here because I, I, I am following you on the different social media platforms. I yeah. know there's something going on in Bangkok, but I don't <laughs> really what are you doing exactly. So it's a pleasure that we are doing there's a lot going on in her social media that's for sure (laughs) too much too much (laughs) not sure more than mine no 
No, no, you are the king of social media, seriously. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, Sophia and Clemens. I am so happy to have you because when thank I texted Sophia, when I texted Sophia, she told me, "Can I bring my supervisor?" She, of course, yes. So it's a, it's an honor to have you here, and yes, you are our storyteller as well. I would love to hear more about you. How would you love to introduce yourself? Tell us about your passion. Okay, well, in terms of my uh, educational background, I'm less mixed than uh, Sophia. I'm an anthropologist in all levels, um, uh, more specifically an ecological anthropologist. Now, what's ecological anthropology, you might ask? Uh, exactly. Well, anthropology is the study of man, right? Behavior, culture, um, this kind of thing. And ecological anthropology is how man uses, man, of course, man and women, um, uh, use, use resources. So how, how, how much, what for, uh, this kind of thing, are resources used uh, in a social setting, in a community, in order to, in order to um, set up an economy, things like that. So that's my specialization. Um, now I work here at the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, Asia branch, Asia center, we call it, um, where we look at um, trying to influence uh, environmental policy uh, from a research perspective. So in fact, I'm the um, lead of the policy team, which means I work with the different research groups and um, we try to take the results that they generate and push them into different policy audiences and policy processes. So, um, sounds perhaps a little bit boring, but um, we, I think it's an important step because if you look at academic research, mm -hmm. uh, it often just ends when the journal paper is published, when the thesis mm -hmm. is published, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go beyond that. And what we're trying to do here at SEI is to, is to push those results out to those people who might uh, be able to use them in a, in a, in a very practical way. So I, th I think you're, you're doing you're doing a great job because this is the I think this is the aim of doing the research that we're gonna use it in a right. practical way. Otherwise, right. it's end up on the you know in the library and nobody care. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Um, and and in fact, uh, I have a good example from my from my last job. Uh, I worked at a regional university here, and they were keeping all their uh, theses, all the 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 theses from the um, students that graduated in the library. Then there was a, re, uh, a huge flood, like a, 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 a 100, once in a once in 100 year flood, and the entire library got flooded. So all the theses before digitalization so were gone, right? ah. and that's it. Uh, which is a huge shame, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but um, but it shows even more that we need to make our research results applicable mm -hmm. to some type of end user. It doesn't have to be a politician, but some type of uh, end, end user. And, and that counts for like the social sciences as much as, you know, techni technology or design or anything like that. Yeah, I totally agree with you because <clears throat> I also feel a bit sad when, you know, like the researcher do a great job and then it's end up in a great paper, but actually right. the people who are supposed to work with it Right. Don't really in touch with this paper or with this uh, researcher. Right. So, I think what you do is a really good job. And again, I'm I'm happy to have you here. So let's start to talk about the the urban rural sustainable links. So let's start with you, Clemens. Can you can you define for us what is a rural area and what is an urban area? Um, I'm not sure I can really define that very well for you because especially, let's say, in the last 20, 30 years, the, those areas have been, have been uh, much less distinguishable as they had been, as, as they had been before, right? Um, I think when we look at Europe in the Middle Ages, it was clear, right? The urban area was everything inside the city wall. And everything outside was the was the rural area. Nowadays, we have, um, if you take the example of Bangkok, right, which is a hugely fast-growing um, city, almost, uh, if I'm not mistaken, almost 20% of the population of Thailand live in one city, mm -hmm. Greater mm -hmm. Bangkok. Yeah. So, 
um, of course, there's a city center, a, a business center, and a historical center, and that's quite clearly urban. Um, but if you go to the fringes, it becomes much uh, uh, more difficult to define because you have intermixed areas, rice fields, banana plantations, factories, uh, something like, I heard that, I can't, I can't verify the number, but something like 30 or 40% of the world's hard drives are produced in the outskirts of of Bangkok. Wow! So, so it, there is a huge uh, um, technology indus digital technology industry around Bangkok. A huge um, uh, auto parts, the Japanese uh, companies that produce auto parts here, mm -hmm. industry, and that all happens in an area that used to be rural, maybe still is your rural, but in fact. Uh, is becoming less and less rural, rural by the day. Of course, um, <clears throat> even in Thailand here, you still have very rural areas, meaning um, not much infrastructure. Uh, a lot of it is not connected to a larger grid, um, perhaps not easily accessible, what we call remote. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, communities that are um, characterized by minority people or vulnerable people, people that are pushed out of the city, yeah. um, and, uh, and, and, um, and a, a lack of, I would say, also economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason why we have all these mega cities in, in Asia is that people are unfortunately escaping the rural area because there's no opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and this is both a problem for the urban centers because you have uh, development of slums, squatters, yeah. things like that, un unreasonable or un inhumane almost sometimes settlements. But it's also a problem for the for the rural areas because they are depopulized. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the 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 people are missing. Sometimes, sometimes uh, let's say the men are missing. You know, sometimes the women are missing. Um, uh, but but regardless, the labor is missing. So even though the economic opportunities already less in rural areas, it becomes even more less when you have these um, uh, migrant flows into the cities. Mm. Yeah. So sorry, not being able to give you a better definition. I just was um, just thinking that, okay, so now there is not a specific boundary between or line between right. urban and... Yeah, exactly. And actually, it's also fascinating because we've been exploring the concept of peri-urban or also called uh, rurban area which is that very undefined space between the urban and the rural that you cannot really define geographically, but it has some kind of characteristics, like for instance, um, industrial, commercial, residential land use, uh, sometimes agricultural, but uh, it's interesting to see how, for instance, in Bangkok, they're trying to keep the agricultural land uh, as the peri-urban ring to ensure food security, um, but it's, it's very hard because uh, there are other forces that are those industrial and commercial ones that are prevailing. So mm. I think that's interesting. It has a lot of uh, um, potential, um, but it's also right now very hard to control, I think, from an mm. urban planning perspective. Mm. So, so there is a, a one more as a kind of transitional area between the urban and rural, like urban as you call it. Yeah, yeah. and and I think it's not it's not only just a transitional area; it's very dynamic. Mm. Means the changes are so quick that urban planners cannot catch up with um, uh, with with with, what's with the happening. speed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just just an example in Bangkok, um, because uh, it's usually the industry. Uh, that starts these peri-urban areas first. You know, you got rural area, then the industry comes in because land is cheaper, they can build their factory. Uh, and then they have to put in a certain amount of infrastructure, yeah. water, electricity, all that. Mm -hmm. But the planning only goes to that particular area where the uh, factory is being built, right? So they make it floodproof, for example. But making a factory area floodproof means all the other areas surrounding the factory are more prone to floods, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The water yeah. needs to go somewhere. So exactly. those communities become more vulnerable and, 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 and therefore 
are more prone to move out or or or, or move into the city or whatever. Yeah, so, like one one more reason to move out. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, so the planning because it's only like um, I'd call it like symptomatic planning, right? It's not really long, long term in advance yeah. uh, uh, planning of a whole area. Mm -hmm. um, that creates uh, creates a lot of uh, a lot of issues for the resident communities there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we we were gonna talk a lot about this specific point because this is the the, the most important actually to to mm -hmm. how to rethink the planning. Sophia, I would love to ask you. So so what are the flow between the urban and rural? Is there a flow? Yeah, uh, actually, it's super interesting this point because it's actually what I'm looking at with my PhD. So <laughs> I'm prepared for this. Um, so yes, there is a flow of uh, things between uh, urban and rural. Um, it's not only a flow of resources, as we may think. Uh, it's not only a flow of food or uh, natural resources, but also a flow of information sometimes, a flow of people that are going from the rural to the urban, as Clemens was saying, because usually there are better job opportunities or better educational opportunities so people are more attracted to go to urban centers also because of the narrative that has been going on you know of like this big city life uh, and uh, all the opportunities and young generations wanting to to live the dream in the city and not stay in the disadvantaged rural community um, because this is the general perception usually um, but also, yeah, a flow of information, a flow of uh, natural resources, uh, um, cultural ecosystem services. Uh, it's huge. For example, in terms of like traditions and uh, cultural beliefs, uh, it's huge the value that you can find uh, in rural areas. Uh, for me, it was very eye opening because uh, I've always loved cities. Uh, you know, like I've lived uh, in Budapest, Paris, uh, Stockholm. I loved it. And then I was like, yes, I'm going to move to Bangkok. Um, but then COVID happened and it made me, um, it forced me to look at the local context. So I was forced to look at what was happening around me uh, at the regional level, not only at the urban level. And I think that's when I really shifted my mindset and looked at rural communities in a different way. And uh, by going there, I got the privilege to access all these amazing uh, cultural assets and traditions that in the city sometimes we don't really find uh, on a daily basis. So I would say that there is, there is a flow that is going on uh, and uh, so on the other side, there are a lot of urban people that are feeling disconnected to nature right now. So they need to go back to nature or reconnect to nature in some kind of way. And uh, because of the lack of uh, green spaces in cities uh, uh, in, in Bangkok, like we can see it now, I'm looking outside and it's a lot of skyscrapers and no green at all. Um, People feel the need to escape from the city and just uh, go back to nature and uh, reconnect. Yeah. 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 From what from what you are telling, uh, Sophia. So, I felt that the urban is more as a receiver, getting things from from the rural. Is it true? Like, what can the rural offer? You mentioned the nature. Is there anything else that the rural can offer for the urban? Mm. Uh, I think there is a lot, uh, also in terms of unexplored uh, potential that we can we could get from the rural, because so far we've been very stuck in this development mindset uh, that uh, mm, pushes us to get the resources from the rural to feed the city. We have mm. to feed the city. We have to make the city grow faster and faster. Um, but we could kind of shift the paradigm paradigm and look at how can we as urban citizens invest in the rural uh, more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Clemens, uh, tell me more like what can we in the urban offer the rural instead of just taking? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, um, I mean, I, I see the relationship more as an interdependent uh, relationship, but it's unequal. That's for sure. Mm. Because it's toxic. Um, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's like a relationship that you you can't get out of, you know, <laughs> because because you might be uh, economically dependent or something like that. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, you have you have flows of food, obviously. You have flows of energy that always move from rural to urban, right? Um, you have flows of uh, other resources such as water, right? You have flows of labor, as we just discussed before, you know, the human labor moving to the city. Um, and what, um, what uh, um, Sophia just said is, I think, an important one. The, the, um, the, the, the um, custodians of the traditional culture usually live in rural areas. You know, uh, I've lived in uh, Australia before, and definitely there's the, that's the case there, that the custodians of the original Australian culture um, live in, in usually in rural areas. And, um, and if they move to urban uh, centers, a lot of it is very quickly forgotten. So there's a lot that, that rural has to offer um, and, and that the urban is dependent on. For, for, for sure. But it also goes the other way around, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's especially what um, the, the last thing that uh, Sophia said, investments, you know, investments in infrastructure, um, uh, planning of, of rural areas. Obviously, it'd be great if rural areas could plan their own areas, uh, um, but it's often not the case, uh, uh, as we know, because planners usually are, are people in urban centers. Yeah. Um, exactly, they, from the city. Think in mm. silo, that's the problem, yeah. I think. Um, but, but definitely, and, and definitely also funding, you know, investment yeah. funding needs to move from urban to rural areas to make them livable, to make it exciting or interesting mm. to, uh, to, to live in, uh, in, in rural areas. And that includes economic opportunity. You know, if all the economic growth is only concentrated in urban areas, you're sooner or later going to run into a problem in the rural areas, uh, as we see in, for example, the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. or, or in many other places where the rural areas are just uh, are just um, uh, neglected. I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Sophia, you mentioned now it's more uh, silos, and uh, there is an urban development plan, rural development yeah. plan. So, what do you think? How how should we rethink, and why should we rethink? What are we going to gain? I mean. We used to do it, so it kind of works. We used to do it. We have methods. Why should we rethink it? Yeah, you know, it's it's so it's so hard to think uh, about the overarching situation and go beyond this silo approach, uh, because usually you talk about urban development and rural development, mm -hmm. and uh, very I don't know. It, it's very hard to find uh, cases in which planners are looking at like regional planning and integrating the two uh, in a very coherent way with uh, um, objectives and goals uh, that merge the rural aspirations uh, and the, the urban needs uh, and the urban aspirations. Um, and that's why sometimes we talk about fragmented governance and uh, fragmented land use and uh, yeah, fragmented urban planning because it's, it's hard um, it's hard to make these different realities fit sometimes, in particular if you consider sometimes periurban, since it's in the middle, you don't really know how to treat these lands. And the problem now, I think, is that we have uh, um, increasingly growing cities and the city is expanding. So the urban and the periurban, how do you define them? How do you measure them? How do you monitor them? Uh, the periurban is expanding and you don't even know how how fast mm. um, so urban planners i think should be a bit more flexible in the way that they operate and maybe a bit more collaborative mm. and uh, open-minded um, and this is not to say that they've been doing it wrong but it's to say that the world is changing at a very fast pace and maybe we need to rethink our approach to how we do urban planning nowadays yeah and uh, clemens tell tell me like what do you think about this that uh, should we have a joint planning like rural urban <laughs> and also how how can we start doing it like yeah. how do we rethink well i think actually and this brings me back to uh, my work i think actually a good place to start is the sustainable development goals mm -hmm. 
in particular sustainable development goal 11 sustainable yes. cities and communities yes <laughs> so you got the cities on one hand and the communities which is mm -hmm. which are usually in the urban area or maybe mm -hmm. the peri-urban um uh, are uh, in, in the rural area so yeah. if we think that as one and we think of cities as not just an agglomeration of infrastructure and buildings and uh and 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 probably uh, banks and and companies and things like that, but actually also communities. Um, we'll see that, you know, a, a a a a neighborhood in Stockholm might not be that different from a rural village in in Thailand in terms of the social dynamics that are happening, in terms of the aspirations that the people have, in terms of um, how they want to stay within their their community but uh have economic opportunity at the same time mm -hmm. and upward mobility at the same time yeah. so i think if if we we definitely have to get rid of this dichotomy rural and urban um but also um bear in mind that um you know there are areas that are underserviced um and you know, give more attention to them. And whether those underserviced areas are in urban or rural or peri-urban areas doesn't really matter, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. And I think uh, you mentioned SDG 11, uh, and actually the target 11.A is uh, about uh, creating sustainable linkages, uh, environmental, social, and economics um, between urban, peri-urban, and uh, rural areas. So it's very much related to this. And then how do you measure it? It's hard. Like they, they didn't come up with uh, concrete indicators, but I think the, the path is there and the UN has already highlighted this issue. Yeah, yeah. And Sophia, you mentioned also like urban planners and so on that are responsible for doing uh, this. But I believe now it's our world is more complex and uh, it's not only urban planners anymore. Who should be part of this? Who are the stakeholders that really should take this responsibility and, and do it? What do you okay. think? If you ask me, I would say young generations um, and social enterprises uh, should have a bigger role because, uh, um, okay, from my personal experience, I am also collaborating with a startup here in Bangkok and uh, we are female led, uh, young. I'm the oldest and I'm 25. And uh, we are trying to connect uh, urban consumers uh, and rural food producers. And I think we are part of a new generation that is trying to find the links between uh, the rural and the urban, and also to change the narrative, you know, mm. to make farming uh, cool again. Um, that's kind of a slogan. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, to make the, 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 um, farmers and not these uh, um yeah to, to change the paradigm and to make the farmers the knowledge brokers uh, the people mm. who know a lot about food production and from whom you could uh, learn a lot uh, yeah. so i think uh, i think young generations have uh, a lot uh, of potential also in terms of social media yeah so uh, clemens we have a uh, the young generation as a big player on in this yeah, game what do you, what do you <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? We have Sophia, the startups, but not you. <laughs> I you think, think that's super. I think that's super important. But I would add the the old man's perspective as well, uh, which is for that to happen, for farming to become cool, it needs economic opportunity mm -hmm. and it needs fair um, fair compensation. You know, um, if we if we look at farming specifically. First of all, farmers are not being paid enough, uh, given the fact that they're producing the food that we eat on a daily basis, right? But it's not only that they produce food, right? Like we said before, um, they preserve ecosystem services, right? They take care of the forests. They take care of the cultural landscape, you know? Um, the, what we treasure so much in Europe the beautiful landscapes, they're never completely natural, right? They're man-made landscapes, and the farmers are the ones that are the guardians of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they take care of um, 
a lot of the climate, uh, sorry, the carbon sequestration, right? Uh, through farming, through uh, um, uh, also farming uh, forests. So um, all these things, and, and the EU is, I must say, the EU is a pioneer in this, in that they, they provide, for example, subsidies for fallow. They provide subsidies for, um, um, for traditional land races of, of, of livestock and also of, of, uh, of crops. So um, these kind of things, I think, provide more economic opportunity for people to even have the potential to find it cool, you yeah, know, yeah. because if there's no opportunity, you can think something's cool, yeah. but you're going to, you're going to starve of hunger. You know? Yeah. No. yeah so, in, in the end, you, someone, you need, you need money to survive. Exactly. And I think, and, and we, we talked about um, the, the, uh, all the cultural knowledge that's stored in, in these communities and that's passed on to the young people, right? But uh, again, we must give the young people the opportunity uh, or maybe the uh, young people must take the opportunity. I'm not sure which one it is um, yeah. to, be, to have this knowledge and this tradition passed on. And some of this is, is, is definitely happening, but, um, but um, I, I'd agree with uh, Sophia that the main stakeholder is the residents of rural communities that sort of have the aspiration to remain in rural communities. Yeah, diversifying livelihoods is basically what 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 I've just been talking about. You know, mm -hmm. if we see rural people as only people that produce our food and that's it, um, that's not a very diversified livelihood, right? Mm -hmm. Because all they can do then is to enter uh, a the food um, the food market sort of, and and um, if if. Um, I'll try to come up with an example. Uh, rice farming in in Thailand, right? Because we're here in the region, and we we mm. can we can talk. Rice, as you know, in Asia is it's important. Is, is it's huge. It's is important, it's and like it's pizza actually, in Italy. It's actually, I would say, even more so even because more. because <laughs> rice uh, in in many languages in the region, um, eating rice means eating. Okay, mm. if you're eating something else, it's not, it's not actually, it's not, eating. Real it's eat. not yeah. nourishment, it's not food. I'm from Iraq and we have the same. If you don't yeah. eat rice for lunch, it's, it yeah. doesn't count that you ate something. Exactly. So. Yeah. so here it's even more extreme. Here you ask, what did you have with your rice? Ah, yeah. yeah. It's like a base. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, yes. So that's the, the basic, but... Um, but now, uh, and, and we still have something like, I believe, uh, up to 40% of farming is still rice farming. And Thailand used to be the biggest exporter of rice worldwide. So they, they managed to uh, satisfy the demand within the country and then be the biggest exporter as well. I think Iran was one of the countries that they exported to. Mm -hmm. um, now they fell down to like, number five or something and the reason is they make rice farming completely unattractive so if you are only a rice farmer you cannot make a living regardless how large your your your, your farm, farm may be right um so you're basically forced to diverse either diversify or move out of farming and we, the move out of farming we already covered that with the migration into the cities right so yeah. uh, so you need to diversify but if food prices are being kept low all the time, it's just unattractive. It's mm -hmm. never going to be cool, mm -hmm. you know. It's always going to be almost cooler to work in a factory than, yeah, yeah. Uh, than because then you can afford a mobile phone or whatever yeah. uh, than to work on your own land uh, and produce only food. Mm -hmm. So if farmers aren't uh, co uh, compensated uh, adequately and given additional opportunities, yeah. For example, um, uh, agriculture. Uh, no, agritourism. Agritourism, right? Yeah. So they might have the they might have the opportunity not only to produce food but also serve that food to urban consumers that find that particular yes. area uh, attractive or, and or whatever. And also enhance the links with the urban people because otherwise they're very they feel like they're very disconnected. But at the end of the day, as we were saying before, there is this flow of resources and people. And if you 
manage to create the sustainable links as SDG 11.A wants to achieve, and you manage to connect urban consumers and rural food producers in a sustainable way, mm. sustainable for me means also sustainable over time. So it's something, it's not a one moment project that then uh, like uh, the fund, uh, the, the grant is finished and uh, it's over and the rural community is left mm -hmm. on its own. But it's mm -hmm. something that creates trust also between mm -hmm. the consumers and the producers, for instance. Creates trust and creates value because value. In, in the end, again, like we said before, uh, if, 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 if there's no economic opportunity, they're not going to continue to do it. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we use a lot uh, the word sustainability in our visions and goals, but actually this is, I, I think this is one of the mistakes we do is that we don't really break it down to the site level. So I would love to ask you, we start with you, Clement. So tell us about sustainability, how do you break it down? And especially now during the COVID, how do we redefine the links between the urban and rural? This is a big question. Um, <clears throat> How do we define sustainability? Um, I think there's, you know, there must be a thousand uh, definitions around on what sustainability is. But if you ask me what, what is it for me, um, I, I'd like to quote one of my um, influences, uh, C.S. Holling, um, who said that sustainability is a bit like human rights. We're never going to achieve it, but we need to aspire to it at all times, right? So there is no, you know, as soon as there's humans, there's gonna be exploitative resource use. I think um, it's best perhaps encapsulated in the concept of circularity. So for me, the, the concept of circularity encapsula encapsulates uh, sustainability well, which is uh, use resources as efficient as possible and reuse waste uh, to become resources, right? Mm. Uh, and I, I think that's pretty much the best we can do. And that counts not only for materials, that counts for energy, mm. that counts even for skills and knowledge, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the traditional knowledge that we have in our culture might not be or might not look very relevant uh, nowadays in, in 2021. But I think if we redefine some of this stuff, uh, we might actually be able to learn um, to 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 learn from 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 these uh, from these um, from from this um, from this uh, sort of embedded knowledge that we have in our culture. You know, a lot of it is coming up with the you know the hipster movement and so on. They're going back to traditional techniques of, yeah. of permaculture or yes, or, or preparing food or yeah. something like that. Uh, but and we can use that, you know. And there's no shame in 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 using. Uh, old knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, the the basic definition of sustainability and sustainable development, you know, like considers the three pillars of environment develop. No, environment, society, and uh, economy. And uh, but I think uh, we could be even a bit more flexible nowadays and integrate. Like, okay, consider these as the pillars, but then integrate some dimensions that are relevant to our society. For instance, if I'm looking at sustainable food systems, uh, I think health should be there because health is so important. So many of us are eating in a non-sustainable way or like non-nutritious way. So health should be there. And uh, maybe it's uh, intersectional, maybe it's uh, uh, cross-cutting, uh, but uh, yeah, I think we can be a bit more flexible in how we mm. define this uh, huge word uh, that uh, nowadays I think it's a bit of a buzzword also. So. Yeah, and Sophia, you're you're doing the research now and I think you have more knowledge in this field. So tell me, are there many research being done in, within this field, like rural urban, urban links? Mm, yeah, that's very interesting. Actually, I did some literature review on the topic and uh, there is there is some some research, uh, but uh, in the research that I've uh, screened, uh, there is this uh, mainstream narrative that I was talking about before, about the city that needs to be fed, 
um, and the rural areas uh, that are these like hinterlands that you can get all the resources that you need from. Um, so I would even define it as a colonizing kind of literature at the local level, because as a city, we want to grow as fast as possible. And uh, in order to do that, the best resources are outside. So we need to like uh, get them and then use them and then produce waste, but we don't care. And uh, this fast paced kind of development, I think it's, it's very scary and uh, very um, colonizer like uh, in my opinion. At SEI, we always talk about decolonizing knowledge and how we should uh, decolonize and uh, deconstruct all these fixed kind of uh, um, systems of thinking and paradigms. And I think uh, when we talk about development, sometimes uh, in particular urban development, there is this narrative that I see in a lot of articles um, that is a bit uh, dangerous maybe if we consider long-term scenarios because it's non-sustainable and uh, it considers the perspective of the urban dwellers and uh, the urban citizens but doesn't really consider the counterpart and how our choices as urban consumers uh, or urban people affect and have an impact on the rural yeah. side. Yeah. If I can just give an example, mm -hmm. um, the biggest economy in the world, China, uh, is of course in our region here, Southeast Asia, hugely influential, right? If you look at, and there are the planning masters, right? They have their whole, all, their whole system of governance, governance, government, yeah. um, the economy, everything is based on planning, right? There's nothing is invisible hand or you know markets that balance each other out nothing is like that right and you look at the way they and um i'm i must say that they are taking sustainability extremely seriously so all i know from my interactions with chinese government officials even chinese citizens they take the concept of sustainability very seriously uh, the they call it ecological civilization is a bit of a different term, uh, but they put that into their constitution. Mm. Um, so as a country, they strive towards more sustainable uh, uh, living. If you look at the plans that are put in place, there is a huge urban bias, right? Mm. So eco-friendly cities, mm. carbon neutral cities, right? Um, then they have this whole issue of the sponge cities the, the as well. Sponge cities, uh, mm. right? They, they have this whole concept of uh, uh, coastal cities oh, yeah. where they have all the, the the plastic waste in the in the uh, in the in the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. But everything is city focused. And in the meantime, we know very well that uh, a lot of the rural areas are are very neglected um, in, in 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 China because they just don't get uh, they don't get, um, they don't receive the same amount of attention mm. in the plans that are put in place yeah. as, as the urban cities do. So yeah, I think yeah. also visibility, like when we talk about research, um, and maybe also grants, grant opportunities, I yeah, think, sure. um, the, the city side has a lot of space and, uh, the rural counterparts, I, I'm, I wouldn't even say counterparts because if we consider the regional setting, it's like it's the same thing. Um, but yeah, there is there is a huge focus on uh, urban development or uh, yeah. urban planning, which is good, but I think could be um, considered in a more holistic way sometimes. Yeah, I can imagine there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done in order to 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 lift up again the rural area or the the farming or the the non city. Mm. stories or people I, I have a question actually in mind we're talking about farming and so on I would love to hear your point of view do you really believe in the future that the vertical farming urban farming will, will take over so we don't need the rural anymore no what do you think no, no. I would say no as well no I mean you know uh, urban farming vertical farming it's nice you know and um, it, it it helps for sure it helps aesthetically 
it helps in community building. Um, it helps in some cases where the where you have short lived crops like vegetables, some fruits, where you need short uh, transport distances. Uh, it it could help, but all of the models that I'm aware of use more energy uh, for farming and more water for farming than uh, what 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 uh, what is used um, in in a comparable. Uh, urban setting. So what do you think? it's not sustainable. Yeah. What do you yeah. think, Sophia? Yeah, I also think that um, like at the pace that we see now, like the, the cities are evolving at a very, very fast pace. As we know, like we see all those data about uh, urbanization and urban growth, uh, which is massive. It's huge. And so many people are coming to live in the city. So I think it's not realistic to think that we can actually survive with those like vertical yeah. or urban farming kind of experiments. Although yeah. I think they are very inspiring and also they inspire us to go back to the source of food and reconnect to, yeah. the, to the rural side. But I think we still need to work a lot on our relation with the rural hinterlands because yeah. uh, we need them we are dependent yes. on them i agree that there's a lot of uses um for urban farming that are not food necessarily right mm. i mean greening cities that's something that we we all appreciate and we all yeah. want um a, 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 you know more plants absorbing uh more carbon out of the cities uh and and uh, and just for our well-being as urban dwellers. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's enough studies around that say the more, the greener a city is, the higher the levels of well-being is. For this, it's it's great, and like uh, Sophia said, connecting us back to where the food comes from and so on. But to to produce bulk amounts of food, no. So to summarize, you it's not really going to supply our demand. And, and that includes like agriculture on mars and stuff like that oh yeah I mean, that's all <laughs> my dreams yeah 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 i i understand so i'm i'm so happy to have you again i'm very inspired by you actually because also we are not talking so much as you mentioned about the rural area the planning the focus almost in the city and so on so thank you for being here and i would love that to we finish this great episode by you giving us two takeaway messages so we start with you clemens to take away messages to the listeners? You go first, I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Under pressure. Uh, okay, two take away messages. Uh, okay, the first one, I think, would be um, to challenge your concept of boundary. Um, because sometimes uh, it's just in your head. And uh, in reality, for instance, if we think about the rural and urban, sometimes this concept of boundary is very blurred and it's very normative. Um, and this applies to anything, to life, uh, to concepts. Uh, challenge your concept of boundary. Um, and then uh, the second one would be rediscover um, the benefits of uh, rural hinterlands for the city, which could be cultural and tradition wise, as we were mentioning, but also uh, the preservation of our planet and our natural resources. Yeah, thank you. Clemens, do you have two takeaway messages for us? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think, I think, um, so I, I agree with, uh, with, with what um, Sophia just said. Uh, I must say, in, in, from my uh, biography as well, I grew up as a as an urban kid, right, and um, lived in cities all my life, <clears throat> and because I'm, anthropo I'm an anthropologist, right, I told you before, um, we used to have this method of participatory observation, right, where we just stayed in a rural community for a long period of time, in my case it was a year, and just did whatever the people did, learned how they do, the, how they go about their living, my case, it was a rice farming community, and I had, I didn't even know how to cook before I, I came to that community, right? And I really had to relearn how yeah. to live, you know? 
And I'm not saying everybody should go and spend a year in a in a remote village because there's a lot of challenges to that. As well, <laughs> I can imagine, especially when it comes to privacy and things like that. <laughs> uh, everyone, um, listeners. <laughs> but, but um, it it I think it it taught me a lot, and I still uh, I still relish the time that I was there um, because it 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 taught me. How to um, how to use uh, resources in a more efficient way? Because if we just buy the stuff, we don't think about it. We might throw it away. Ah, oh, you know this. I don't like this anymore. Throw it away. Um, if you're in in a completely different setting as I was, you think twice before you throw things away, or you you uh, you know if you harvest something or you 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 hunt something you're going to use the whole thing and you're not going to only you know not only the the breasts or whatever part of the animal you want to eat but you're going to use the whole animal because it's not so easy to get a new one right something yeah. like that so um take home i'm not sure but but um but but uh, what sophia just said is is sort of uh, Harking back to that, that sentiment that you know it's hard work to produce food, and it's hard work to produce all these other things that we mentioned uh, throughout throughout this uh, conversation. Um, that should be appreciated. This is a sentiment that we have the responsibility to also pass on to the stakeholders, whether these are policy people or whether these are audiences that might not be aware of, 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 of these interlinkages. Yeah. That was a long take home message, but, uh, no, but I think, I, think I it's hope you know great. what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I think it's all about appreciation that we should really pay attention to what we do, like every moment we live as well and appreciate the resources we have. So thank you so much for your messages. Do you have any questions for the listeners? Because I am always asking, and now you have a space if you have a question for the listeners to reflect. Yeah, I have a question. Um, think about when was the last time that you really felt connected to nature? And where? Where was it? Was it in the city? Was it in a park in a city? Was it outside the city? Just reconsider and think about it. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, before I leave you and before we finish this episode, what is going to be the next step for you? So for from my side, uh, I'm still working on my PhD. I'm in my second year and uh, I am working on passing the ethical exam before going to the field, if COVID will allow me. Um, yes, so I'm guided by amazing supervisor. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. How many how many years is your uh, PhD? Um, let's see. It should be around two more years, maybe one and a half to something like that. Two. Yeah. Let's say two. Not yeah. more than two. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. it's enough of Sophia. For... <laughs> so what is the next step for you, uh, Clemens? Uh, yeah, we have a. Uh... Here at SEI, we have a number of really interesting projects that we're working on. Um, I think one thing that I mentioned is we, we are working with the Chinese Ministry of uh, uh, Environment um, to, um, to improve the uh, cooperation um, on environmental policy between China and ASEAN. ASEAN is the Southeast Asian um, Association of Nations, like EU, but in Southeast Asia. Um, so, and we are advising this process, um, so it's, it's, it's quite high level and of course our impact will be minimal at the end, but I'm thinking, you know, any type of impact that we can make, um, is, is, is a positive one. Um, and, um, just as an example, uh, we just finished on a much lower level, we just finished, um, uh, um, advising the, uh, the uh, coffee industry in Laos. So Laos is a neighboring country to Thailand, very rural, very agricultural country, uh, but very good as it turns out, um, soil and uh, climate for coffee. And in fact, coffee has been there since over a hundred years since the French colonized uh, Laos. Um, and it's one of the potential 
specialty niche, um, but also sustainable farming, ag, uh, um, 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 uh, what's it called, organic uh, markets for coffee. And um, so we're advising them on how to institutionally improve uh, the industry as a whole, uh, because we do think that uh, they can only really grow and start exporting if they if they develop as a as a as an industry and not just as individual farms. Yeah. Um, so we're we're trying to help them to to get to that stage and really become sort of a, a hotspot for coffee in Asia. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. So I think you're doing a really great job, and I'm so happy to be in touch with you. I wish you all the good luck with your research, Sophia, and with all the project that you're running, uh, Clemens. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mustafa. This has been an uh, enjoying experience. Amazing, and keep up the good work. You're doing thank, great as well. Thank you, yeah, thank you. Really, so, yeah, I need, really good I work. need a hashtag for the Instagram, as you know. Ah, okay, so you're turning to me. Specialist. <laughs> I think, um, hashtag uh, Rurban, okay. R Urban. That's good, hashtag. Thank you so much, and we keep in touch. Okay, yes. Thanks, Mustafa. Well, thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. You learned something new and also got inspired by the guest. Don't forget to share the episode on your social media and recommend it to people you think they are really interested in this topic. Thank you so much again for giving your valuable time to Urbanistica podcast. I am Mustafa Sharif. Keep up the good work. Keep loving cities.